And I'm chatting with Stacks. Welcome to this episode of Chatting with Stacks. I'm your host, Bill Stacks. And today, I got Larry Rolla. What's up, Larry? I am. I'm do. I'm good. Thank you for joining me. I really appreciate you it's taking my, the time. It's my pleasure. So you have a really interesting story. You were on a lot of people. You were ingrained in some, some major money transferring through uh, your winnings and all that throughout the years? It was a pretty interesting life. And uh, unlike unlike most kids, I grew up in the, you know, in, in, in the city. Uh, you know, you're surrounded by uh, what you're surrounded with. And then it all depends what path you take. And, and I guess I took the path where uh, I was impressed early on with the pinky rings and the beautiful girls and the big cars and and I went down that path for a while but I soon found uh I I didn't really it really wasn't my thing I I wasn't a vicious guy or a mean guy and uh, you know them joining gangs at 14 and 15 and and going to these street yard fights with baseball bats and zip guns and getting your nose broke every year and your head split open I I really didn't enjoy it and one day I just made up my mind that this is not what I wanted to do. I didn't want to follow the leader. I didn't want to follow anybody. I wanted to do what I wanted to do when I wanted to do it. And that's exactly what I did. I enjoyed music. I enjoyed racing cars and I enjoyed women. And that, and that's what I pursued. The only problem I had was that uh, racing cars and women, uh, they cost money. And uh and you had to do what you had to do uh, to to support these um, these habits that I had, and and I did, and, and uh, I crossed the line at a very young age and got myself in a lot of trouble. Um, and I was lucky enough that uh, my mother worked for uh, Tommy Lucchese, one of the forming uh, one of the five members of the bosses of uh, the Casa Nostra in New York. And basically in that time, in the 50s and 60s, he controlled the city, he controlled everything. And and uh, and uh, one day um, I got myself in a, in a, it was the first time I ever took in a partner do, do, doing a robbery. I used to steal a lot only to support my, uh, you know, if I blew an engine in the car, I had a dragster and a roadster, and I raced a roadster at Freeport every Friday, and a dragster in, 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 uh, um, in, in, in West Hampton on Sundays, and, you know, you blow an engine or a clutch or whatever, you need money, and, uh, and uh, I had no money, so I did whatever I had to do, whether it be robbing gas stations or whatever, and uh, one time, the only time in my life, because I was after I made up my mind to quit the gangs and everything, I just wanted to be by myself and do what I wanted to do. I had to take in a partner because I blew an engine in the in the dragster, and I needed a new engine. It, 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 back back then, it was about five or six hundred, and when I was robbing the gas stations, I'd only get thirty, forty dollars, and I had to look for a bigger score. So. Um, there was a gas station on 112th Street, Astoria Boulevard in, in, in Queens in East Elmhurst. And it was it was it had a grand opening and he had all brand new tires and brand new transmission jacks that uh, oh, back in them in them years in 55, 56, all the cars were switching from standard shift transmissions to automatic. And you had to buy these new jacks. They were very expensive and very big and very heavy. Uh, the transmissions weighed four or five hundred pounds, so uh, you know you needed. But anyway, he he uh, he had the whole setup, and um, I decided to rob that station because there was thousands and thousands of dollars worth of uh, tires and equipment. The only problem was I couldn't 
do it myself. I couldn't lift the jacks onto the, the box truck that I robbed. So I, I asked a friend of mine, Joe, to help me and um, make a long story short, six months later, I got a knock on the door. It was Detective Sands from 114 Precinct. And uh, he took me down to the, the station. And, uh, and the first thing he did was just push a piece of paper in front of me and says, sign it. And I said, what is it? He says, a confession. He says, look, we have everything you robbed. We have the guy. We have everything. We just need to know who your partner was, where he is, and uh, sign this confession. And I said, I'm not signing nothing. And being an arrogant 16 year old jerk i he, he come across the table and he, uh, he come around the table and he and he slapped me and when he slapped me i i hit him in the belly and um the other two detectives in the room immediately cuffed cuffed my hands behind the chair and uh they proceeded to well detective sands did he went got one of them big law books and pounded me on top of the head until my eyes were bleeding, my ears, my nose, everything. And uh, and then they uncuffed me and they said, sign the confession. I wouldn't sign it. And they, he hit me again. I fell to the floor. They start kicking me. I rolled up into the corner in a fetal position. And uh, they, they uh, start jumping on my ankles, got that long pole they used to push the windows up with, start jabbing me in the ribs and everything. And... Uh, and then I think I was unconscious because I woke up in the tombs downstairs at three three cells in the bottom of the precincts. And uh, three cells, one 40-watt bulb, six inches of water on the ground, rats as big as dogs. And uh, they left me there from, uh, I think it was Friday, to, well, Thursday night until Monday morning. They took me to uh, to a courthouse, I think it was on Queens Boulevard. And uh, naturally, my mother was there, my father. And they got me out. And uh, I told my mother I was all bloodied up. My clothes were full of blood. I, I was I was a mess. Uh, my blood, dried blood in my ears and my eyes. My head was split open. And I told my mother, I says, look, you got to you got to get I can't breathe. I'm having trouble breathing. My ankle was I couldn't walk. It was as big as a football. And uh I said, you got to get me to the hospital. I says, I'm having a lot of trouble. I'm in a lot of pain. And it was it was bad. And she says, I'm taking you where I should have taken you two years ago. Because I, I was just that kind of kid. My mother, that was the only thing she ever failed. I was trying to control me. And uh, I, um, I, I was a problem for her, but I was defiant and... and so anyway, uh, she says, I'm taking you where I should have taken you two years ago. And she took me to her boss, Tommy LaCasey. And we walk up there. I'm all bloodied and in, in a mess. And uh, uh, he, we walk in the office and uh, he says to my mother, I, I, let me speak to, to your son alone. So he gets me and he says to me, um, he says, listen, your mother's a good woman and she's my good friend. And you're breaking her heart with all your nickel and dime bullshit. Now, I'm going to tell you something. You want to straighten your life out. I'll help you in any way I can. And you'll never have a problem, including the one you have right now. Now, I want you to go home. Think about what I said. And just remember, your mother is my friend. And know who you're talking to. And uh, I left and... Uh, I, I thought about that because it's something I just never thought about. I just thought I was a, a you know, a kid that didn't listen to my mother and do what I want to do. But I, you know, the thought of her heart being broken because of my bad behavior and always getting in trouble, and she's always bailing me out. I, I really changed my life around. I, I did. I, I, I went. I, I, I went on the right track. I can't get into that whole story because we'll be here until December. Do you but, know uh, what what did you know who this guy was? Did oh, you know, know his association before you went to see him? Yes, I I, I, I knew who he was and I and I, I knew I I knew how important he was when my sister got married and he came to the wedding and we had to make a special table for him and his he come with four or five guys 
they had to be off in the corner. You know, they stayed for about an hour and then they they left. I I, I knew I I knew then that he was a a special guy and who he was and um so I I I knew and uh, and he he was right in what I said. But when you know when you're 16, 17 years old, you just do stupid stupid stuff and. Uh, and I was lucky enough that, uh, and the ironic part is that here's a guy that probably <laughs> the most the most feared guy in the whole world, a head of a, a, a mob, uh, Casa Nostra, a, a family that's that's named after him even up till today, and and feared by all, controlled everything, and uh, he put me on a straight path. He put me on the right path. I mean, uh, uh, I don't know what would have happened if I would have said, let me join your crew. I probably would have been uh, down on Zariga Avenue or something in the water or something. But anyway, he put <laughs> me on the right track. And uh, and without getting into the whole story, I'll just say that a couple of years later, um, one of the so-called good guys, one of these white collar guys that own racetracks and everything uh he became a judge and jury and barred me from racing uh for something i didn't do and and so it was ironic that a so-called bad guy put me on the right track and a so-called good guy for his own bullshit reason um um got me to the point where I had to do what I had to do. Uh, and, and, and it sent me right back onto the wrong track. I tried to correct it, but at the time when I went to my mother and said, look, this guy just accused me of something I didn't do. And I'm barred from racing. Um, I says, can you ask your boss if he could straighten it out? And, she, and at that time it was right around, it was, he was in a hospital with a malignant brain tumor and he was dying. So I was basically on my own and they sent me in uh, because I was barred from racing from all the uh, horse racing, from all the, the major tracks, which was Yonkers and Roosevelt. I went to all these small Mickey Mouse tracks and uh, and starved to death for two or three years. I wind up, uh, you wind up, you, you get very creative. You never think you'd eat a pigeon, uh, <laughs> but you you wind up that that was like a, a steak dinner to me if you lucky enough to catch him did they eat pigeons back then well uh, look if you if you're just just picture this and and, and like i said i there's a, a whole lot i left out already how i got into the horse business but we'll scoot right along because there's so much to talk about uh and that's why that's why uh when i had the meeting with uh nicholas Pelleggi and, and richard price and, and ed burns uh, Sony Pictures and, and the Village Roadshow, which is the largest distribution of the film, uh, we had a contract uh, to make a movie of, of my life. And uh, after sitting talking with them, uh, they decided to make it a TV series because there is much too much information that they would leave out in, 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 a, in a movie. I, I mean, like the movie Casino, they had 350 voiceovers. We would have to have 500 voiceovers to cover a lot of the things that happened in one day, just so the movie would be a 10 hour movie. Yeah. So, um, uh, now I forgot, I forgot why I went down this road, but, um, uh, the, the, uh, this, my, my story, was bought by them and they gave me, uh, they bought the option to my story for 16 months. So, um, and that was 2019. So when we when we made up the contracts and Pelleggi thought it, it should be um, a TV series because there was too much information, I really wanted it to be a movie because at that time I was 82 years old. This was a couple of years back. And, uh, um, based on the contract we had two contracts one for a movie and one for a tv series and based based on the movie contract uh, it was going to be a hundred million dollar movie and i was going to get two percent right off the bat that's what i wanted you know if i was 40 i would have taken the tv series because everybody says you make a lot more money with a tv series than you do with a movie 
you know, you should load the bases before looking to hit it. And I says, look, I'm 82. I My life expectancy was five years back. I says, I just give me the two million. Let me wind up in Vegas with a, a thousand dollar hooker and let me just live out my life like that. But <laughs> uh, what happened was, as we were deciding, uh, COVID hit. We went out to California in 20, 2020 and COVID hit. And um, they shut California down for two years. And then when they reopened, my the option they had on my life was over. They asked me to resign. And I said, I would resign, I would resign if uh, you started this back up again, only because of my age. If I was 40, I'd say, all right, to finish up. Because they had a lot of work in progress that they stopped in the middle. So I said, uh, because of my age, if you can't get to my thing right away, uh, I'm going to have to pass. And uh, they said they couldn't. They had major projects in the middle when they shut down. So I, I understood. But at the same time, I had um, these two brothers, uh, Nick and Frank Vallelongo. They wrote a movie. I don't know if you ever, ever saw it called Green Book. Uh, yeah. It was about... Um, it was about their father, who was a good friend of mine, uh, Tony Lip, and uh, um, they won the Academy Award. They won the best screenwriting and everything. And they had called me when my book first came out, and and, and that and that's when I book. I I wrote the book because I was encouraged to write it by, uh, you know, guys like Joe Pesci and Frankie Vincent, and and the real guy that that made it happen was. Uh, Frank Collada, because we did something in 1974 uh, that he called me up years later and says, asked me if I would mind if I put that that incident in his book. He was writing a book. And I says, I, I, I didn't care. And then he said, you know, uh, he called me back a few years later. I think I met him at a wedding a few years later in California. A mutual friend got married and he was there and uh, he said to me, he says, you know, you should write your own life story because the chapter in my book, uh, Casino Mobster or whatever the name of the book was, uh, Frank Collada wrote it. Uh, he said the, the, the chapter I get the mo most asked about is the chapter with you. So between all my friends and everything, I wasn't doing nothing. I was sitting home, bored to death. So uh, a friend of mine helped me write a book and helped me get it self-published. Uh, the only the only problem with that was uh, I never wrote a book. I never wrote nothing in my whole life. And he told me, he says, look, get it self-published so you own the story and uh, keep it under 85,000 words and put it in the good, the bad, and the ugly. And I says, how the hell am I going to do that in 85,000 words to cover 20 years? I says, yeah. but I did it. So I I put I put some of the stories in. I, I limited them to 1% of what the real story was. But uh, it satisfied the pe people in California. They sent for me right away, and that's how that whole thing started. Now, after COVID happened and that whole thing fell apart, the Valongo brothers got a hold of me and they said that they had read my book and um, that if my contract, if I didn't resign with, with Village Roadshow, that they would do the movie. So I agreed to that. And we were talking and we used basically the same contracts that I had. And uh, they were they were going to uh, we were going to start probably uh, in December of last year. So one of the brothers, Frank flew out i picked him up at the airport and he wind up staying with me for a couple of weeks till his brother nick uh, came so when his brother nick came we met and we start talking about the script and um and uh they we had a script and uh they they uh were talking about and we were getting looking for locations and everything and then and then frank calls me up one day and he says uh he says, my brother has to go to California for a couple of weeks. He says, can I come back to your house and stay with you? Because, uh, you know, I don't want to stay here by myself. I don't know anybody. So I said, sure. So he was supposed to show up that Monday night. And Monday night came and he never showed up. And I called Tuesday, no answer. Wednesday, no answer. Thursday, I got a phone call that they found him dead in the street in the Bronx. What had happened was he went to, uh, before he came to my house that, that night, 
he picked up a hooker, shot over to uh, to the Bronx, got some cocaine. It was laced with fentanyl. And he died right there behind the steering wheel of the car. And the girl, the hooker, robbed all his money and his ID. And a couple hours later, I think it was, uh, some homeless guy come by, saw him, slipped over the wheel. And they, he dragged him out, left him in the street, stole the car. And how they found all of this out was that the building they were parked next to was uh, had cameras. So that's how they found it all out. So naturally, uh, the brother, the other brother, Nick, at the funeral and, and, and well, at the repast, really, uh, he come over to me, he said, Larry, he says, we're going to have to put everything on hold. He says, I'm, I'm devastated. I have to go back home I, I i got to straighten out a lot of stuff and i said no, no problem uh he gave me his he says here's my personal cell number he says uh, if you need me before i get back to you just give me a call so i knew i was never going to call him it was devastation uh something i uh you know i only witnessed with my mother and father when they died but uh i knew it was tough and and some people handle it a lot worse than others and he was yeah. one of but right after that, I came home and uh, Barry Barry O'Brien, the, the writer for um, Law and Order, and Blue Bloods, I think, but Law and Order, he 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 called me and he wanted to meet with me. They were shooting down. I live in in New Jersey, in Lyndhurst, and, and they were shooting. They shoot all them Blue Blood things and in, in L.A. law and and uh, Law and Order things and. Greenpoint, Brooklyn, which is only a half hour away. And he wanted to meet with me. I met and uh, he uh, he very much wanted to make my life a TV series. We started that whole process. We um, and then the, 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 the we, we started. We started. We have about 10 or 11 um, episodes done with the whole pitch and everything to hook up with a streaming network, whether it be Netflix or whatever. And uh, and we were ready to go and we, we were gonna fly out to California. Uh, I, I think it was May 2nd or 3rd and, that, and that's when the writer's strike happened. So that whole thing got put on hold. So uh, now we're, we're, we're on hold with that. Uh, there's nothing we can do because he's a SAG member and part of the union and there's nothing he can do. But hopefully it'll be over, and he he said maybe in September, October. So uh, in, in, until then, uh, I'll continue with the podcast that I have. And the reason we started the podcast was, was because we were going to uh, make a couple of episodes real quick as an intro into the TV series and as a pitch. And uh, well, this happened. So now, now. Uh, I have nothing else to do except walk my dog and and uh, do the episodes, <laughs> the, the podcast. So that's what I'm doing. And and if I'm gonna do it, I'm gonna do it. So uh, right now I'm I'm trying to figure out a way because I'm co computer illiterate, and uh, but I have good friends that help me with the podcast and 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 do it all. I just sit there and tell the story. And there's a lot of interesting stories that, you know, that my association with the mob because of horse racing and, and fixing of races and, and, and horsemen and how I did it and why I did it and where I did it. And uh, right now, um, there's many of uh, the first couple I did already have thousands and thousands, seven, eight, ten thousand views already. I don't follow that much. My friend tells me who does this stuff. And uh, I'm getting, I stay up half the night now because my friend says, because I, uh, on the podcast, I always say, please send in your questions because it helps me remember things and helps me fill in gaps that I leave out because I'm talking about things that I did 50, 60 years ago. And it was so much. And every day it was another adventure that it was different. In fact, even to write the book, when I wrote the book, I made, I made, it took me six months of phone calls to friends and that were in the horse business and, and other mob guys that t tell me what I did back then. Tell me, tell me stories. And, and there's probably stuff you left out, right? Oh, lots of stuff I left out. And, mm -hmm. and, and now that the podcast is up, I, I'm getting stories that 
I didn't even, I did, good stories too that I, I didn't even remember. But uh, what about oh, this guy, John Gotti? How did John you meet Gotti. Well, How did John you meet Gotti, him? <laughs> John Gotti, I met when we were kids. When I first quit school, when I first quit school, I didn't quit. They threw me out as soon as I got sick, became 16. They threw me out. My mother, for punishment, she says, you want to be a tough guy? You want to be a wise guy? She put me with my Uncle Pepe. My Uncle Pepe ran the piers on West Street in Manhattan. And uh, they suited me up with a pea cap and a pea coat and a hook on my shoulder. They, I had to be down in West Street at 5.30 in the morning. And I stood very much like that picture on the waterfront. That, so if you saw that or if you remember that, that describes it pretty well. 30, 40, 50 guys on the corner. My Uncle Pepe on the platform there yelling who's going to work that day and who's not. So they told me, just keep my collar up. I was 16 years old. And uh, they uh, they pick he picked me about the thirtieth guy. They put me down in the hold of the ship, and and I was no problem. I worked, and and he's my uncle says don't talk to nobody, just do your work, and and that's what I did. The only problem with that job, I was making good money. I was making more money then than my father was making driving a cab, and yeah. Uh, um, but every Friday when you got paid, there was a crap game. So you automatically got your paycheck. You gave it to the mob guy in the corner that cashed it for 10 bucks or whatever it was. And you went into the crap game and and, and within a half hour, you, you were broke. And you go home and your mother beats the shit out of you again for losing your pay. That <laughs> happened about three weeks in a row. And she went to my uncle. She says, can't you stop him? And he says, look, I, I control a hundred guys i can't be babysitting him uh so anyway she pulled me out of there and she put me with my cousin pete graffia who ran who was the boss of uh, a trucking company in Maspit, queens called i think it was mid-state specter and as punishment he put me on the night shift as the gas man for the tractors and the only one that was there at that time was uh I think his name was John Caputo. I, I, I'm not sure, but he was the switcher. And the switcher is the guy who separates the trailers from the tractors and, and parks them, and then separates the tractor, brings it to the gas pump, and I gas it, gas it up and fix whatever flats they, they might have. But John Caputo was a terrible heroin addict, and he needed lots of money and uh it was something kind of new to me because I used to rob gas stations and all of a sudden I found out that um, he was robbing freight and, and everything and and I started doing that too and I had a big Lincoln at the time with a big trunk and I was able to put one of them big trailer truck tires into the trunk one in the back seat and I had a garage where I lived in Jackson Heights uh, I rented for I think five or ten dollars a month where I put my my stock car and I parked the stock car outside. I, I covered it up with a top and I filled that whole garage up with tires. And then one day, um, well, well with the tires, that's what you're looking for and all the other stuff that we were robbing together. I was looking for a, a fence where somebody were that I could sell it to. And, uh, I ran across John Gotti because all the thieves know all the thieves and Gotti at the time was six. He was the same age as me. And uh, he had, he had many connections. He was part of a crew uh, where he lived in uh, not far from Jackson Heights. I think it was up past Corona, Regal Park or whatever that area was. And uh, he, um, he um, had a lot of outs and he he got was able to get rid of all these big trail truck tires. He knew people had owned uh, garbage trucks and stuff, and he got rid of them. We whacked up the money. And then one day, my cousin calls me, and he tells me that there's uh, three trail loads of Cuddy Sock whiskey coming in. He says, uh, tell John to back the trailers into the Holdem yard. They were going to stay here for a, a week or two and gas up the tractors. And uh, that's what I did. So I told John, and uh, and and John backed them into the Holdem cell, and then we devised a plan to rob them. But I asked 
I got a hold of John first, and I said, listen, if I get three trail loads of Cuddy Sark whiskey, there were 1,100 cases in each trail load. They were quart bottles. Do you have an out for them? And he says he, he, he'd find out, but he and he did. He had a guy that owned a couple of catering halls, and we wind up getting robbing them and getting him the uh, – and we whacked up that money too. So I knew John from the time we were we were kids. Um, and after that incident, I had very little to do with them because shortly after that, I I, I wind up going with the horses, and I won't get into that whole story how that happened. But then you uh, start meeting other gangsters when you well that you... that that happened once I got into the horse business, and uh, now we skip ahead a, a bunch of years um skip ahead maybe maybe six seven years and um i i developed a terrible sports betting habit so between my um between the girls and the and the and cars and the, and being broke and everything uh i had to um I got involved with one of Whitey Bulger's guys when I went went to Lincoln Downs with the horses in 71. And uh, it was the first time Lincoln Downs had a harness racing meet there at Lincoln Downs. And I was sitting there one day and uh, I was happy to be there because that was the, a new track that opened, had bigger purse money than all the other small tracks I was racing at and starving to death. And sure enough, down the shed row come uh, three gigantic guys. They look like the front line of the Green Bay Packers, and they, they get to me. And I had two horses in that day, opening day, and both were morning line favorites. And uh, and uh, they they reach me, and the guy in the middle, um, he says, you Larry Roller? I says, yeah. He says, uh my name's Tony Shuler. He says, I'm with Whitey Bulger and the Winter Hill Gang. We we control all the racetracks around here. And uh, are you interested in making any money? And up to that point, I was broke, penniless, tired of eating pigeons and bran mashes and everything. So, um, like I said in the book, I think, or whatever, I, I I wanted to jump up and kiss him on the lips. But, yeah, uh, yeah I, you said I, that. No. I, in the uh, podcast, you're like, I want to kiss the guy. Yeah, I'm I, I, I so happy. I wanted, I, I, of course I want, but I, I, you know, I, I, you know, I grew up around these guys. Uh, I, you know, and, you don't show them your excitement. Yeah, right? I, the, yeah. The very little. I, in fact, nothing really intimidates me. We got a minute and a half left, uh, and um, before I, this I, ends, because it ends automatically. Okay, so I'll I'll make it real quick. So. Uh, <laughs> He offered me a couple of hundred dollars to stiff my horses. I uh, told him I wanted 500. He gave me the 500 and he says, I hope you know what the fuck you're doing. I hope you know who you're dealing with. And I said, listen, my word is better than anything your vet can give my horse. I said, um, he says, uh, I hope you're right because I'll be back in the morning. And I says, just bring coffee and a bagel and I'll see you in the morning. <laughs> and I, I finished back the way I, I said I would and, uh, and from there, we started an unbelievable relationship that took me all the way into the next seven or eight years where I made millions and millions of dollars fixing races with Tony, and uh, but losing it all to uh, bookmakers, uh, Kabert and a, a Jewish bookmaker called Bonnie Cutler. And... Uh, and they got to a point where all my cash was gone, and then I took a shot at them, and lost another eight hundred thousand to between both of them. And uh, both decided to, instead of killing me, uh, they would make it a Shylock loan, and uh, the loan was two points a week. So between the two of them, I had to come up with sixteen thousand a week in Vig. If you guys like this show, hit the like, subscribe, and notification bell. I'll be dropping part two this week. Stay tuned. And remember, don't be a bitch.